Um, so good to see you, Nathaniel. Yeah, Luke. Awesome to have this this conversation uh, this afternoon. Um, I just got off a flight uh, yesterday, so I'm back in Los Angeles. Nice. Well, I'm I'm uh, I'm in New York, so it's uh, actually it's it's been a real great day here. It's nice, right? Similar to LA weather right now. All of a sudden, it's yeah. different from the summer. Um, Nathaniel, I mean, it's really great to have this opportunity to talk to you about something that I think we both care about. Uh, you know, both of us, I think, self-identify as Christians. Both of us have had unique experiences uh, connecting to Israel. And both of us have, I think, through various means, come about uh, being really bothered by the, the kind of the rhetoric, the, the, the hate that comes out uh, against Israel and the Jewish people. Uh, why don't you tell me about how you got uh, into this? Was it how you know when, when did you go to Israel the first time? What what kind of got you into this? Yeah, movement really. Yeah, so I mean, my journey is I, I became a Christian fairly uh, late in my twenties. I was twenty seven when I first sort of uh, entered into sort of a, a I would say a real relationship with understanding you know um the, the person of jesus and you know many years later uh you know uh when i was uh, it was 2012 when i became a christian 2016 was the first time i started to become more interested in israel um i spent some time in iraq i was working uh at a refugee camp in iraq in 2016 uh which is the closest i've ever been to the middle east um and the following year i went to israel and in 2017 i had a probably a very strong opinion about what I was expecting to see in Israel. I grew up in a very um, Islamic Middle Eastern culture, uh, surprisingly enough, in, in Sydney, Australia. Uh, and so I had already had sort of a, 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 a sort of a, a pre-understanding of what Israel was um, with very little interaction with Jewish people up until up until that point. Um, most of my, my my friends growing up were either Lebanese, Syrian, uh, Iraqi. So, and and a lot a lot of the influence came from um, an Islamic point of view towards the nation of Israel. So I was wasn't expecting much when I first went. Um, and what surprised me most in 2017 is the vast contrast of what was being said by many people um, about Israel and what was actually really going on uh, on the ground. And the more time I spent in Israel, uh, I've done 11 trips now. Yeah, it's just blatantly obvious that um, so much has been manufactured to, to really turn the world against this nation uh, and to really kind of create you know, very similar propaganda, which is constantly being used against uh, not only like a nation now, but really specifically, you just get, it's, it just comes down to the Jewish people. So, so you know, the, the longer you go on this journey, the deeper you go into it. And I think as a Christian, uh, if you've never brought up Israel in a conversation, if you've never spent much time around Jewish people or even sort of seen how these communities operate, uh, whether it's in Israel or outside of Israel, uh, I could understand why you probably wouldn't really think that this is a big uh, topic of discussion, but um, but the moment you start engaging, you actually do experience and feel the level of hate that comes back just towards the very mention of the name, you know, Israel. Yeah, it's it's it, same to me. I think I had you and I have had similar experiences. I mean, I think for me, I I went to I went to Israel for the first time in 2012, and I would say, you know, I was. I grew up in Seattle. I I don't know if I knew any Jews um, when I was growing up. I mean, I, I've been telling people that I really don't know if I knew any Jews until I was like 38 years old. Right. I'm 48 now. So I've known Jews for like 10 years. But before then, it was like, it just wasn't, it, they weren't in my life. I had no, I, I didn't know if I had Jewish friends or not, you know, because like, it wasn't like an experience. But going to Israel for the first time in 2012, I was like, man, this place, it, it, it kind of got under my skin, right? Like mm. it just, there's something about standing in a place where, you know, Jesus taught and, and walked and, you know, ministered and stuff. Like I, I remember, you know, I went up to the Mount of Olives and I was overlooking the city and it was raining. It was March, it was cold. And, you know, there was, um, you know, I called my wife later that day and I was like, yeah, today I went up on the Mount of Olives and I went to the place where Jesus supposedly ascended into heaven. My wife said to me, well, like, what do you mean supposedly? 
I was like, yeah, what, what, what do I mean supposedly? I, no, I went to the place where Jesus ascended in heaven. It's like, I blew my mind, right? And so I, I feel like there is this, there's this connection that Christians uh, make with the Jewish people and, and Israel after having gone, mm. right? But unfortunately, for a lot of the last 2,000 years, there's been a really antagonistic relationship between yeah. Jews and Christians. Yeah. And I, I'm curious, like, how do you see that? Like, what was the, what do you think was the transition point that made it like suddenly, you know, it's like we're, we're not in the mode of like there's a Jew hiding under that rock, let's kill it, right? Like, right. Like, hey, maybe we should be friends. Right. Something. Right. Yeah. So, so what, what you quoted is, uh, is, you know, um, a very well known hadith, uh, which is the sayings of, of, of Muhammad, who is the, you know, the, 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 the well-known prophet of Islam and, and his perception of end times is, is really connected to the Jewish people. And, and this is where he makes his claim that, you know, there's going to be a time coming where Jews will be running and hiding and, and it's on uh, the responsibility of Muslims to go and find them and kill them, which is shocking to hear. Um, but, but you, that, that really just that, that Hadith alone and that statement really helps you to start understanding that this is uh, such a more complicated issue than just a nation of people trying to live in the land that they have a historical setting in. Um, so, it, you know, it is, it's, it's, it's kind of, there's just so many facets of this conflict that I think this is the problem with Christians today. It's there's so much so many layers of understanding that you need to get to culturally, religiously, uh, geographically, um, and and for, you know for so many Christians that we we have today they don't even read their Bible, right? So you know it's kind of hard to get them to even really kind of understand what's happening in Israel when they don't even have a really really strong basis of their faith. So to answer your question, what was it that really brought me into this understanding of the Jewish people and a desire to understand them more, a desire to really kind of track their their story and their history, you know, not just from um, you know a biblical point of view in the Old Testament, but now. Um, and so I think for me, you know, as a Christian, uh, my early days as a Christian, I spent a lot of time just my understanding of Jesus and my understanding of the Bible was whatever the pastor spoke. So I would go to a church, get the feel good message, uh, you know, sing some praise and worship and whatever the pastor taught on Jesus was my basic understanding. I never kind of went deeper. I never went into my own personal study at that point. Um, but when I did, when I did start reading the Bible for myself on, uh, on a daily basis, on a, on a regimented basis where I wanted, I wanted to understand the scriptures um, as they were presented the further I went into the text, especially the Old Testament, the closer and closer I started to come saying, if I don't understand the Jewish people, I have no chance of understanding Jesus. Yeah. No chance. Um, and, and Jesus, like all things um, in a corrupted world, can his message can be corrupted and manipulated and, and taken out of a very, very specific context. You know, so some of the verses that started standing out for me and started to really challenge me were, you know, moments where, you know, Jesus in, in the gospel says, I've come for the lost sheep of Israel. Right. So who are the lost sheep of Israel? You know, this, this nation of people that God has a covenant relationship with, you know, through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that is an everlasting covenant. It, it doesn't end because this church age started and, and then God is doing something very, very specific with these people. And you know, we see this even in the writings of Paul, who, who makes a very clear distinction between the Jew and the Gentile. Um, you know, our, our, our means of salvation is, and our means of justification is the same. It is, is, it is through Christ alone. But our sanctification is quite different. And, and so working out how a Christian and a Jew comes together, or more importantly, how God is going to bring the Christian and the Jew together in these final days is kind of really what made me go, I've got to start paying attention to these people because just like Jesus says, I've come for the lost sheep of Israel. And, and I don't think that story is anywhere near being finished. It's still in progress. And I think for us as Christians, if we really want to be true disciples of who he is, we must understand his people and the patterns that keep getting presented throughout their history to kind of know where we're at in this timeline of what's going to happen next in the Bible and where we really are in the story of God. Right. And I think, you know, you get to, you know, for a lot of, you know, church leaders, you know, they, they rely a lot on, on people like, you know, church fathers like Augustine, right? And Augustine can look out of his window 
and see the Jews scattered yeah. after 70 AD and after 132 and the scattering of, 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 of the Jews around the world. And as they see, it's because of their disobedience to the revelation mm. of Jesus that they're scattered, right? And, and yet, you know, I, I think the challenge that I often bring you know, to pastors and theologians and, and people who come with me to, to Israel is, right, like, so you don't have that, right? You have to actually look out your window mm. and see a nation of Israel and the Jews coming back to the land from the north to south, east and west, land, yeah. back to the land that was promised to them as an everlasting covenant, right? Mm. And so I think it's a challenge for pastors. It's a challenge for church leaders. I, I find that Oftentimes they're reluctant to talk about this because, you know, the, the topic of Israel in general, because, you know, they're not going to, they often get, you know, they, every pastor does a risk reward calculation before <laughs> preaching their sermon, right? right? Like who's right. going to give us a hard time, right? And it's like, it, it's like, no matter what, nobody's going to be happy where I come down on, on Israel, right? Yeah. So they just don't talk about it. And yet, it's the place where our faith was born, right? Mm. Like, and and I find that it's it's really is important for I think Christians to be in a position where I think a lot of Christians perhaps don't realize that for most of the last two thousand years there was a very antagonistic relationship. Yeah. We're in this moment right now yeah. where really since the last seventy five years, maybe eighty years, where Christians are not in this antagonistic relationship. Mm. There's more of an affinity growing. And yet at the same time, I think because of the lack of Bible readership and I think of yeah. like a lot of cultural influences, Christians are now going, you know what, like, forget it. I like, you know, I'm not, I'm going to go basically like first step is indifference. And the next step is where we were for the most of the last 2000 years, which is antagonism. Yeah. And I think it's really key for Christians to be like, no, like we can't go back there. Right. Because, you know, it's, it's we just can't we just can't go there you know and and i think that's one of the you know one of the biggest things that like you know it's very hard for i think anybody to sort of get their head around the 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 you know the christian jewish relationship for the last 2000 years uh we have a, an extremely stained relationship with the jewish people uh yeah. You know, uh, we have absolutely failed the words of Paul in the sense of we were to, to make them jealous with our ability to love their God, to be in relationship with their God, to be a community of people who, who are actually driven by this thing that was missing during Jesus' time, which was brotherly love. Mm. Um, and we've kind of failed at that. And we've also failed at just understanding the scriptures. So we've kind of, you know, replacement theology has just taken a huge step in, in, in most modern churches where, where people kind of take on this idea that there's this spiritual Israel. So right. the physical Israel no longer exists. And now I am Israel, but I'm living in, you know, America or I'm living in the middle of Texas right. and I'm going to my Bible study and I am now the new Israel. And yet, and that makes absolutely no sense when you open up your text and you actually see that, that, that this land and this people and uh, and the promises that God had, has made and some of the things that have been prophesied, yes, have come true. And all the prophecies about Mashiach coming have come true, but there's still so much prophecy, uh, you know, in Isaiah, you know, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, that still haven't come to pass, which means the story of these people is not yet done. And, you know, like Paul says, it's a mystery. It's a mystery that we as Christians struggle with because, you know, I, you know, I put it like this. If, if someone came to me and said, um, you know, uh, I'm a Muslim and I pray to God and I, I, my, my, my truthful opinion would be, well, you're not praying to the same God as me. You're praying to a completely different idea of God. You're, the presentation of your God has, shares nothing in common with my God. Yes, superficially, we might have some things in common, but fundamentally, we couldn't be further apart. And yet, if a Jew comes to me and says, I pray to God, I can't say they're not because they, they, they are believing in the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, you know, and, and really the, the biggest and only issue that both a Christian and Jew have against each other is, well, who identifies Mashiach as Yeshua or Jesus and who doesn't, you know, but everything else we agree upon. So it becomes a really complicated relationship to navigate because it is unlike any other belief system um, where we're the ones being invited into their story um, 
and and that's kind of like where we need to kind of sit with this that it's their story with god and we've been given a beautiful invitation from the father to actually partake and enter into that so it, it's it's far more complicated than just evangelizing to you know uh, someone of a you know a hindu faith or a buddhist faith or, or even a muslim faith or an atheist um and so the jewish challenge there is is so unique and and that sort of plays into this world but also what we start seeing is you know as we talk about this topic of apartheid um today and we look at like how this nation has been painted with such a horrible brush by the world right. and has so much hate and discrimination against them you know you start to go why yeah. where did where does right. this hatred come from and where does this consistent bias and and you know i mean like we can talk about the UN and we can talk about the number of, um, you know, uh, complaints and, and, and uh, you know, uh, human right violations that the UN claims that Israel's had more than any other nation. Um, when you've got people like China, Russia today, which is currently in a, a you know, a, a war and completely no violations are being made. And yet this small nation of you know eight million people is being targeted consistently and constantly and that's when you start realizing this is biblical this is yeah. not just geopolitical politics that we're watching unfold with two people who can't get along this is a right. biblical problem that we're facing and how how god is going to use all these pieces to bring the conclusion of his story well i think that's i mean that's i'd love to get on that topic because one of the things that i i've begun to the way i've begun to describe why there is this irrational hatred of the Jewish people? Mm. I, I think it comes from the fact that they are the people by which God, God brought His moral revelation into this world, and the world hates Him for it. Right? Yes. Like, like you know, by nature we're going to be pagans. We're just going to like, yeah. like obsess about you know, you know, praying to the rock and the tree and the whatever. Right. right. right? And and by this revelation being given to this people on Mount Sinai, God is putting His his law into this world, his moral order into this world and saying like, no, it's not what you think. It's this mm. way. Mm. Right. And, and, and that being a universal message. Yeah. Those that like are resistant to that obviously will hate the Jewish people because of that revelation. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I think that, you know, that, that is the reason why the Jews are often scapegoated as the like, you know, the real true problem of the world, yeah. right? Like yeah. if you were against communism, the Jews started communism. Right. If you're against, you know, uh, capitalism, the Jews own the banks. If you're against right. Hollywood, the Jews run Hollywood. If you're against Absolutely. newspapers. And and we live in a day in which like the, the, the determining factor is always like, who's the, what's, what's the, the highest moral position a person can have? Well, you, you have to be, um, you know, is human rights. You got to be for human rights, right? Well, then who is the greatest human rights abuser? Mm. Oh, the Jews. Yes. Is, right. Yeah. Because, because whatever the world has determined to be the, like the highest moral truth that we can achieve or, yeah. or strive to achieve, the Jews are obviously the worst at that thing, right? So that's where we get into this, like Zionism is racism. Why? Because obviously mm. being anti-racist is the highest moral Absolutely. truth right now well right. then who's the greatest racist it's it's the jews right yeah. and, and i think any you know most you know most conversations you enter into with people who uh you know have um a palestinian uh, bias or come from an islamic world or an islamic point of view do see what the jews are doing uh, as um a conflict to what they want to achieve. You know, Islam obviously um, conquered so much of, um, of you know, uh, the Middle East and even made its way up through Europe, um, you know, and, and what we saw is, you know, Islam was conquering and, and Islam got control of, of this holy city of Jerusalem. And, um, and, and, you know, part of the mentality, and, and this is really one of the other things that, you know, I think a lot of people need to understand is the different foundational structures of both belief systems you know the, the jewish the jewish uh, you know the Ju judeo-christian uh foundations are really you know found in mercy and forgiveness 
this is a, is a religion based on mercy and forgiveness. And we see this, how, how God instructed the people to live. We see how the, the sacrificial system was set up with, with forgiveness and mercy sort of being really the major theme that runs through knowing that we're a people um, that don't deserve his mercies, but, but, but we're given them. And thus we must show these mercies and kindnesses and forgivenesses to others. Whereas, you know, the Islamic framework is an honor-shame culture. So an honor-shame culture and uh, a mercy and forgiveness culture are going to have very, very different ways of operating in this world. And, and the problem with this honor-shame culture is that because, you know, the Islamic uh, nation had control over Jerusalem, they could never think of losing it. Because if you lose it, that's shame. And you've lost this right to this land that you conquered with war and you were successful in it. So to, and the only way to sort of get this honor back is to win it back. So it's these two, these two groups when, you know, and sadly, you know, the majority of, of Palestinians, you know, and, and, and in, in this conflict are under this Islamic custom of honor and shame, that the only way that they see a victory, the only way that they can, you know, actually feel like they've won something back to earn their honor is to defeat this Jewish nation. And so that creates another issue that like a lot of, you know, people from the outside in the West, or, you know, if you're living in America, you're like, why can't they just get along? Why can't the Palestinians and the Israelis or the Jewish people and, and, and the Muslims just get along? And a lot of that comes down to a cultural religious, you know, setting as the foundation of how everything is going to operate. So, so that's one sort of aspect um, that we kind of see. And, and, you know, when it comes to this idea of apartheid, it's, it's interesting. What, what I've, what I think is important that when we look at the idea of apartheid in Israel is to first go, why is it being said? What, 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 is the, what is the true meaning of apartheid? What do they want us to believe with the idea of apartheid? And what's the strategy behind calling it apartheid? And those are two really, really important principles. Right. So, you know, this idea of apartheid obviously came from this, you know, the, what happened in South Africa, which was a clear apartheid where, you know, the, the government policies were discriminating against the black people and there was a white minority and they wanted to control over the black majority. Um, and so what I found interesting for the Palestinians to, to, to use this, and, you know, we can even go to, you know, Abbas's most recent comments when he visited Germany, um, you know, he made a claim that there's been 50 plus uh, holocausts uh, right. caused by the IDF against the, um, you know, the Palestinian people. So if, you know, for those who don't know, 6 million Jews were murdered by the Germans, you know, um, during the Holocaust and, and Abbas is trying to make a connection to that. And what's interesting is you see that as the foundational principle of what they want to achieve. They have an idea. So we have this idea of apartheid. And then they say, well, this is the idea of apartheid that everybody knows and understands is discrimination, racism, and uh, control of a group of people. And we're going to take that idea and we're going to put it on top of the Jewish people, even though it doesn't exist and it can be right. clearly broken apart within a couple of minutes. Um, they use that because it's not about the truth. It's about creating the idea. Because if I can create sure. the idea of apartheid and you can relate it to that, then you're going to go, well, the nation of Israel doesn't deserve to be in this land and they're the, they're the aggressors they're the ones oppressing and thus like you said when we're living in a culture where uh, virtue signaling is the most important thing what side are you going to choose right. well i'm going to choose the underdog i'm going to choose a side that that looks oppressed that seems like they're being overpowered because it makes me as an individual look like i'm doing something virtuous by standing with the people who need my help so it's a really interesting you know strategy that they use and it's successful and it's successful because many people won't go to israel you know but so the idea of apartheid um apartheid would would be clearly broken apart if i could find a, a single uh, arab um israeli in politics in right. parliament which you can you know if they have voting rights because the Even you know supreme court like supreme, supreme court, court israel has a has a arab muslim yeah body, right yeah like, so, so, yeah, so, and I think this is the hard thing for people to, and I think probably the, the biggest difficulty for people who have never been to Israel to understand is that there's Israeli Arabs who, are, who identify as Palestinian, identify as Israeli because they have Israeli citizenship, and they identify as Arab because that's their ethnic background. Right. Um, and they have absolutely every single right um, as every single Israeli Jew. There's no um, extra benefits. In fact, if anything, you know, what you find in Israel is they make so much effort um, to uh, make sure that um, Arab Israelis who identify as Palestinians have 
as much opportunity as everybody else, if not more opportunities to go to university, to get better education, to find better jobs, to do all these things, which really breaks down this idea of apartheid uh, really, really quickly. Um, so that's why you see, you know, um, Arab Israelis in, in parliament and you get to see them, you know, in, in different, um, or, you know, like you said, in the Supreme Court, um, you know, they, 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 there's Arab Israelis in the IDF. Um, so that's the first part where you kind of really have to understand that this, has got, this is clearly not apartheid. And if anything, it's the, the, the only apartheid that, that I would say takes place is actually on the other side. You won't find a single Jew um, operating in Gaza. You won't find a single, single synagogue, um, you know, that will be operating in Gaza or even in the West Bank. In fact, um, you know, if you've never been to Israel, uh, when you drive through the land, often you have to take, you know, either the 90 or, or the 60. These are freeways that kind of run up and down, um, you know, up and down Israel. And in certain sections, you'll get to signs where there's these huge, big red signs, which will be in um, English, Arabic and in Hebrew. And it's basically forbidding any Jewish person to enter into these certain areas, which are the areas that are controlled by the Palestinian Authority. They're not safe for Jews to enter. In fact, even just... Um, I believe two days ago, um, some Jewish uh, believers tried to drive into Nablus to go and pray at uh, Joseph's tomb. Their car was hijacked, burnt, and they almost got killed. They got shot at. Right, right, right. That's apartheid. That's, you're not allowed to enter this area, according to the Palestinians. And you know, the Palestinian authorities who have control over policing these areas are not going to go arrest a Palestinian for shooting at a Jewish person who drives through this area. Um, you know, and I, I had a very similar experience when I first went to Israel. Unbeknown to me about any of this conflict, unbeknown to me that this was all this stuff was sort of filtering and boiling over. In 2017, I rented a car from Ben Gurion Airport yeah. and I just said, I'm going to go and drive and visit all these places. Now I'm driving to, you know, um, you know, Jacob's, Jacob's Well, which is in Nablus, right? right? right, right. And I'm driving with uh, uh, an Israeli rental car with a Israeli number plates. Right. And when I first got into these, um, Palestinian areas, I started to realize everybody was looking at me. And I thought like, I mean, it's a Toyota. It's not an impressive car. And it wasn't until after that I realized they were looking at me because I shouldn't be there. And I was really, really lucky that they probably, when I got out of the car, so many times people came to my car, heard my Australian accent and thought, okay, he's just a lost tourist. Right, right. But had I been a Jewish person lost in this area, my life could have been uh, at risk because the conflict in these areas, but in the safety for Jewish people in these areas is, is, is not something that the nation of Israel guarantees. As I say, you're on your own, you cross, you know. So, so that's apartheid. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a complete separation from the Jewish people to having any access into these, into these regions um, that are also still very significant for them. And the world doesn't talk about it, you know. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, Palestinians um, in the West Bank can enter into Israel. Many of them enter into is Israel, even from Gaza, for work purposes. They have visas, they get visas, and they cross the border every single day, and they work. Um, and so you even see that people in the West Bank, where people say, oh, well, there's these walls up, and there's these concrete barriers, which is only 8% of the entire wall, uh, but mostly fences and, and checkpoints, they still have the ability to cross over and many do for work purposes. Um, so again, it doesn't fit the bill of this idea of apartheid. Um, and what you start realizing is, you know, I spent a lot of time in the West Bank um, and I have uh, friends in, in certain areas, which I won't mention just for their own safety, um, that I spend time with. Uh, and they all who are Palestinian say to me, Nathaniel, we wish we could leave. We wish we could be, we wish we could live, help us, help us get to Israel. We would rather be under an Israeli government than a Palestinian one. And that's the reality on the ground, you know, um, because, uh, it, you know, especially as a Christian Arab who is a Palestinian, um, they're persecuted for their faith. Right. They're, they're persecuted, um, you know, more by their own um, communities. Um, and they would rather actually live under an Israeli rule because they have better lives, better opportunities, better jobs, um, so that's kind of really where I started to say this whole thing is a lie, Luke, right. you know, right. um, a lie that is driven by financial gain uh, and a lie that's driven by a hatred towards the Jewish people. I think that, I mean, that one of the things that, you know, we were involved with um, trying to get the Presbyterian Church USA to not adopt a, 
a, a resolution labeling Israel an apartheid state. Right. And one of the challenges was, and I think it is, is that that label gets thrown knowing that it's going to carry all the baggage. You talked about this. It's going yeah. to carry the baggage of the comparison between South Africa, yeah. right? The white um, minority government over the black uh, population. Mm -hmm. And the goal was obviously to dismantle, obviously, the white minority government, right? right. And similarly, like the goal here is actually, right, replacing the, the state of Israel as a Jewish state yeah. with, you know, perhaps, you know, some would, would argue even like a, you know, just a regular, totally 100% secular state, not right. that that's what the Palestinians have themselves right now anyways, or lots of places, don't rage right. right, but you have this, and the, typically the answer is, oh, but it's not, you know, here's, here's the evidence by which it's not an apartheid state, and the problem mm -hmm. with that kind of arguing is that the, the accusation is emotional, and the response is often like facts based. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because it's an, and, and, but it's not really, it was never about the facts in the first place. Right. Mm -hmm. Because there's no evidence that Israel is an apartheid state, but it's rather, it's, as you say, putting apartheid into the stream of consciousness of what is determined to be the, you know, the value of the world. Right. Yeah. Racism, like I said, racism is the worst thing you can be right now in the right. entire world is a racist. Yeah. Right. And so what if, if that's the the worst thing you can be in the in the world, then all these people are going to look for, oh, see, the Jews are racist. Yeah. I was I was in in uh, in Israel and well, on the West Bank earlier this year, you know, and it was, you know, um, you know, Zionism is white supremacy was a was a talk of the conference I was at. Right. Right. Why? Because they were trying to connect Israel with what is like a definitive hatred in the West. Yes. Right? White supremacists Which is are, are bad. White supremacists, yes. Therefore, Jews are white supremacists. Or, you know, like right. that kind of framing is it again, it's not necessarily fact-based. And too often, I think our response as Christians or as, as people who are knowledgeable about what's going on the ground mm. is to explain about the, you know, the parliamentary people, right? Right. As opposed to actually calling out the scapegoating that's taking place, right? right? Because that's actually what's going on here. It's not right. about the facts. It's about putting Israel into, and the Jewish people into that scapegoating motif Right, that they've historically been in through generation and generation and generation. Right, and and you know ultimately, what 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 drives this conflict is terrorism. <coughs> what creates, um, you know, and like, you know, my my friends who do live uh, in the West Bank, who would love to move to Israel, do have a more difficult time. Um, you know, they have to apply for, um, you know. Uh, permission to enter Israel um, and obviously if you have a job you can enter all the time but without work you have to apply for it um, but but the question is why 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 was that put in place by the nation of Israel and that's really where it takes us back to terrorism and violence you know Israel had no desire to uh, build walls and separating boundaries between you know say so be it Gaza or all the West Bank but you know, when you start seeing the number of terrorist attacks and violence that has been um, inflicted on the Jewish people uh, since its inception uh, uh, as a nation and its in the, and its independence in 1948 is 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 unbelievable. And and the amount of times that Israel has had to find ways to coexist with um, a very select group of uh, Palestinians who have chosen that violence is the only option that, that, that you know, and, and look, Hamas is, is, is probably the most perfect example of that. You know, Israel moves out of the Gaza Strip, every single Jew that lived in the Gaza Strip. Now there's, I think, some 2 million people that live in, in Gaza today. Um, and so, so they move out and say, it's all yours. We're out. You have it. You have complete control of it. And, um, you know, what, what's, what's fascinating is, is what they've done with it. They've, they've created as a, as a place to, 
you know, launch so many attacks. I mean, even just last year, some 5,000 plus missiles were launched from Gaza into Israel, aimed at both Jews, Israelis, and Arabs. They don't right. care. Right. Right. Um, and yet, you know, these, these acts of terror continue on. So the necessity to have security measures and strict borders is not in response to discrimination because you're an Arab and I'm, and I'm a Jew, but because many Arabs have attempted to kill Jews and they have no other choice. Um, and every nation would, would be the same. Um, so that's kind of like when you start sort of seeing that and you start actually understanding the, uh, the number of terrorist attacks. And, you know, the, I mean, the other thing that we kind of really need to talk about is how the propaganda is really, really spread on social media. Um, yep. So let me just get back to this point, first of all, about why apartheid is actually such a powerful tool for the mm -hmm. Palestinian leadership. Um, you know, and you look at, um, you, know, uh, you know, you only have to do a quick search. And since 1995, since the Oslo Accord, some $40 billion of aid has gone to um, the Palestinian Authority, Authority, $40 billion since 1995, um, which is massive. It's, it's massive, massive. Amounts it was more, it's more than the Marshall Plan, I think, if yeah. I remember right. Yeah. Right? So you've got about you've got about five million, uh, I think, five million Palestinians. Um, you know, I think you've got like two million that kind of are Israeli. Um, two million, you know, uh, Arab Palestinian Israelis, and you've got about, I think, two million in Gaza, and another million sort of spread out through the West Bank. So you've got about five million people, and you've got this this aid that's forty billion dollars since nineteen ninety five. And you ask the question, where is all this money going, and why are these countries actually not uh, thriving and developing? And and so, what's interesting is when you kind of look at the UN and Amnesty International, who are two massive. Uh, humanitarian organizations, if you want to call them that, um, that, that are claiming that Israel is an apartheid state, and yet they're also benefiting heavily because, we, you know, because apartheid is such a strong and powerful word, yeah. that word translates to giving, and that giving translates into money, and that money translates into profit, and that profit has been spread out through corrupt organizations and corrupt Palestinian leadership, you know, you hear stories about um, Yasser Arafat, uh, you know, when he died, had some, I think it was like, what, $5, five billion or something right, right. like that in his bank account. Um, for the, the, the president of not even a country, it's a state, you know, if, if you want to even call it that. And, and so you kind of start seeing that the, from top to bottom, their leadership is so corrupt. They're either they're bent on terror and 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 extreme Islamic um, uh, ideology that is glorified in violence and war, or they're completely corrupt. And you see conflict within the Palestinian Authority, and they're you know they're fighting for power all the time. So apartheid is actually such a powerful word to use against Israel because you don't necessarily need to show the facts of it. You just need to show anything on social media today that looks like it. And if you can show anything that looks like it, then you're probably going to get away with it and you're going to get a lot of people wanting to give. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I think, I think that I, I'm before we get off into, because we have a bunch of people who have asked us questions. Yeah. Um, I'd love to know, you know, what you have a, you have a, like a clothing line, I understand. Right? I an entrepreneur, love the like. How did you come up with that? What What's the you know what was the vision behind that? Yeah, well, actually, you know, you talk about Mount of Olives, and that's what my my shirt says: Mount of Olives, the comeback king, um, because um, you know, obviously, that's where Jesus is going to come back. So we we you know we know the place, we know the location, we just don't know the time. Um, so uh, I started Palm Sundays. Uh, just during COVID, you know, as an actor, yeah. um, I've actually kind of, it's been more and more challenging to be a Christian in Hollywood, obviously. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've obviously say no to a lot of roles because of they don't really align with my faith. Um, they don't really kind of represent who I am anymore. Um, and, you know, obviously being extremely vocal about, you know, um, you know, being pro-life and being against the, you know, the idea of abortion, supporting the nation of Israel, you get uh, a lot of hate, a lot of criticism as a Christian. Yeah. So it's harder to harder to get work. So I, I, you know, I started Palm Sundays just because I thought, you know, I needed something to do. And I, and I wanted to wear Christian inspired clothing and everything that I saw was just kind of lame. It was just like, Jesus, 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 Jesus. <laughs> and it just was just kind of didn't look that cool. So I just started making a few things and, you know, um, 
it's it's a funny thing you know a lot of uh a lot of people like well what do you do with the profits you know what do you do with the profits you know um trying to keep me accountable and you know i actually I actually do a lot with the money that I make for, to, you know, to help specific groups at what I can. I just didn't want to talk about it. And I didn't okay. want to be the thing that people would purchase it for. I didn't want to be like, Hey, buy this shirt and you help someone because you're not really, you're just buying a t-shirt so you can wear it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I kind of keep that between me and God, what I'm doing with the, um, you know, with, with, with a portion of the, you know, the profits, but yeah, it's really just to kind of challenge Christians and inspire them and encourage them. And, you know, it's always a good conversation starter, you know, not, not to be ashamed of the gospel and the amount of times that people said, Hey, that's a really, really cool shirt. Um, where do I get it? And then you kind of explain to them that it's a Christian shirt um, and you kind of wait for the response, whether they're still going to be interested or not, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. It's good. Yeah. We, we also, you know, I'm, I'm also wearing representing, you know, Philos, uh, Philos Action League, uh, there you go. You know, right. So both wearing our, like our brands, if you will. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I mean, we also, you know, I think, you know, around a similar time, I think we, we talked about this before. It was like, you know, with, with what was happening last, uh, last year in May in 21, 2021 with the rockets and like the social media, the real hate against Jews yeah. that was manifesting itself all over the country. Yeah. And, and we just felt like, you know, like we got to, change the the narrative a bit and mm. you know you get a lot of a lot of stuff happens on social media but i find that you know the real power comes when you actually physically show up right so yeah. in the in the bible where you know the you know people are 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 you know flesh and spirit right right i don't see where we're i, don't, I haven't read anywhere where we're, we're digital creatures right yeah. I mean, like and and so as a result like we need to be more willing to show up when mm. there's issues of anti-semitism yeah. manifest themselves and so we just started doing that and uh the symbol of the fields action league is a white rose it harkens to a group of young professionals and college students who are really upset with what the nazis were doing mm. and so they called themselves the white rose and and so our symbol is the white rose and what we do anytime there's an anti-semitic incident uh we show up with a bouquet of white roses wow. and a card that says just says you know, Christians are standing in solidarity with you, you, you know, to, to let you know that you're not alone. Yeah. And like so far this year, we've done over 75, um, we call them actions. Wow. In response to anti-Semitism. And, you know, I, really the only thing that holding us back from doing even more is, you know, people signing up. So at the end of this, we'll have a, our QR code, encourage people to sign up for the Fuelless Action League. So you can get the alert and know when there's something in your town. Uh, you know, there's a there's I mean, just this month, there's been over 30 anti-Semitic incidences around the country, which is just, yeah. you know, it's like absurd to me. And, well, and you know, yeah, you and need to have need to be on the front lines of making sure that um, Jews know they have friends. And, and Luke, that's that's what's so important about these discussions. And that's what's so important about, uh, I think, the Christian community. Um, really educating themselves on uh you know these discussions with israel so when someone does say apartheid uh, and when someone makes that claim uh, a christian is there to actually challenge that uh that bold statement that false claim um about their apartheid because when we don't when we say nothing uh the world believes the lie and that lie flows into hate and that hate becomes justified actions against jewish people all over the world yeah. you know and and this is how you know that the, the conflict is not just something that is geographically located in the Middle East in Israel. When anything ever happens in Israel and the world starts pouring out um, false claims about this nation, uh, Jews all over the world will get targeted. Um, you won't see a Palestinian walking fearfully in the streets of New York, worried about someone attacking him because of his identity. You just won't. But a Jewish person does not have the same luxury everywhere jewish people go they have to be mindful of who's around them they have to be mindful of their um their environment they have to be aware of whether they're showing their identity as a jew or not and mm -hmm. that was the, the saddest part for me um in my time getting to know these people and spending so much more time with them is to see what it's like you know i i, I went to turkey recently um and my, my girlfriend is my girlfriend is jewish and 
the day before we went to Turkey, um, the, the government put out a, a travel warning for all, all Jewish uh, Israeli nationals not to go to Turkey because they'd got credible information that um, it, the, the Iranian, um, you know, Islamic, um, you know, terror groups had a plan to kidnap Israeli Jews in Turkey um, in order to get back at, you know, the nation of Israel. And right. everywhere we went, we had to be so careful that um, no one knew that they were from Israel. And tell me that, you know, people don't have that problem around the world, mm -hmm. I, you know, and every single Jewish person, you know, I, I remember one day I was in Colorado and I started wearing sitzes, you know, on my, on my sides, just because, you know, for me, it's a really good reminder that, um, you know, the, the principle of that you're being watched um, mm -hmm. and you're representing God's law and representing God's law comes with a responsibility to act in a certain way that doesn't just defame his law, which I think is actually a really, really beautiful thing as Christians. We should, you know, when we wear the cross or, you know, when, when Christians are, you know, vocalized, like even if you wear this t-shirt, you know, if you act badly in this t-shirt and people go, oh, wow, see all Christians are the same. You have a standard to live by and you're putting yourself under that standard. But um, I remember one day I was in Colorado, I was wearing these sitters and this car pulled up out of nowhere. And this guy's just started yelling abuse at me thinking that I was Jewish. And I was like, wow, you know, um, I would never have to experience that as a Christian, you know, that someone's just going to randomly come up to me, not knowing who I am or be able to visualize anything or, you know, pinpoint something about my identity, but a Jewish person hasn't got the same, the same luxury, um, mm. which is an interesting thing, you know, and it's what I really do admire about them, even though they are heavily persecuted, even though they are so targeted, they still carry on doing what God instructed them to do, which is to follow those, you know, uh, those obligations about their identity. Um, and, you know, for me as a Christian, if I'm really truly looking for God, if it wasn't for the Jewish people holding so closely to their law, their Torah, um, to the commandments that he gave them, when I went looking for the one true God of creation, where would I go? How would I know about, you know, how would I know about the prophets? How would I even know about the prophecies of Jesus if they didn't remain true to preserving them and keeping them? So in a lot of way, you know, we, we, ha we have a lot to owe to the Jewish people's resilience to remain Jewish because Jesus was a Jew and you will never understand Jesus if you don't understand his Jewishness. That's awesome. No, I, I totally agree. I'm, I'm, this has been really help, like an amazing conversation, Nathaniel. I want to make sure we get a few questions in yeah, here. Yeah, of course. Really good ones. Um, you know, I think one of the ones that keeps coming up is um, uh, yeah, a question from Miriam. She asked, you know, um, do you really believe that all Muslims are bad? Uh, you know, you know, some have a good heart. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, <laughs> it's, it's an interesting thing because there's a certain point where you say, when I talk about Islam, I'm talking about its doctrine. I'm talking about what's written in the Quran. And I'm talking about, uh, you know, ultimately what is the majority practice or the thing that's going to impact the rest of the world most. Um, you, you will find good Muslims, you'll find good Jews, you'll find good Christians. You'll also find bad Christians, bad Jews, and bad Muslims. Right. Um, but the question is, what level uh, uh, of, you know, wickedness do we find in these cultures? But also, what, what's been inspired by certain words, you know? And, and I think one of the hardest things is, you know, I, look, I will never, I will never have a discrimination against a Muslim person, but I will be very, very clear in my disagreement in what Islamic doctrine presents. Uh, I read the Quran, you know, I spent, um, I spent a lot of time around Muslims because I grew up in a Muslim community. So I understand doctrinally what is believed. And I have a lot of issues with a lot of things that have been written and a lot of things that get taught within Islam. You know, it's, it's not shocking that during Ramadan, the greatest amount of violence is created in Jerusalem. Now, Ramadan is supposed to be the holy month for Muslims. And that's the time where everything is on edge and tensions are so high, especially, especially on a Friday. On a Friday, every Muslim will go to the Temple Mount and their imam and the muftis will speak. And after those messages, a lot of conflict always tends to unflow. And my question is why? If this is the most holy month, if this is the time where they've actually just left a talk that is supposed to preach peace and tolerance, it's very difficult to believe that when you don't see it um, mm. from the believers that are following this, you know, and 
So I think that for the challenge for me is, is not necessarily a Muslim person. My challenge is ultimately, I don't agree with how the Quran presents a lot of things. And, you know, there's verses that you can read in the Quran and I still struggle with today that when I ask Muslims, what does this really, really represent? It says, do not befriend the Christians or the Jews because they're allies with one, one another, but instead fight them and put a tax on the Christians, which is a, um, a jizya, which is a tax that you have to pay uh, if if the Islamic state is the ruling authority, you have to pay because you're not a Muslim. So those things I, I, I don't agree with. Um, right. Would I ever treat a Muslim differently to a Christian, a Jew or an atheist? Absolutely not. But if we get into the topic of, uh, of theology, I'm definitely going to challenge some of the beliefs that the, the Islamic um, belief system presents. Yeah, no, that's good. I, I appreciate that. I think that, you know, one thing I've, I've often heard, you know, the, the issue is that, I mean, it, like, the challenge is, is the religion, not the less the people, right? Yeah. The people are following the religion, but yeah. I've also, I, you know, I tend to, um, you know, our, our, like Philos means friend. And our goal was mm. from the beginning was let's go find friends. And they're yeah. like, you know, not all, not all Muslims want to kill Jews and Christians and no. you know, right. No. And no. So, and so that, which means that there are Muslims that want to be friends. With, yeah. with christians and jews and yeah. right so like let's go find them and let's yeah. be friends and let's figure out what we can do together and what kind of yeah. vision for the region that we can cast right yeah. and because i i mean you know I, there's um you know there's this great play i i like to describe it when i take people to israel there's a there's a junction mm. in which uh on on friday morning the muslims this is an old city the muslims will be walking through to, to go up on the Haram al Sharif to, to pray, right? right? The Temple Mount to pray. And on the Friday afternoon, the Jews will be going on that same road uh, mm. to the Western Wall to pray. Right. And for about a hundred feet, the Via della Rosa is on that same road. Yeah. And and if you read the newspaper, like th there should be nothing but bloodshed, right? Like yeah. the wall should be just covered with blood. And like, yeah. but it's it's not. No, it's not because because Israel a values religious liberty, mm. but people are, are in that in those moments, like they're not they see the value of like let let people do what they want to do, worship how they want to worship. Yeah, yeah. That, that that value is unfortunately not normative in the region. Yeah. Right. And so identifying friends who are you know Muslims who 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 are interested in pluralism we're very interested in that we have a whole channel um yeah. feels project in arabic mm. uh and you know people who are who are who are listening to us who are um who are muslims who are who read and, and speak arabic can can mm. totally uh get on board with what we're doing in that space because i think it's really important because yeah you know i think the oftentimes the line that is drawn is between you know like the moderate muslim is good and yes. the and the 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 radical Muslim is bad. Yeah. The problem is like that's often said from either a secular person mm. or or whatever. And if somebody called me, I don't know about you, Nathaniel, but if somebody called me a moderate Christian, yeah, I'd be, be like, offended. I'd be like, what? Like, I'd be offended. Oh man, I've failed. Yeah, I'd be very <laughs> like, offended. I'm a, I'm a total failure. Yeah. Right. And and I think where we want the line to be drawn is between like basically violent and nonviolent. Yeah, Muslims, exactly. Right? Exactly. Because, exactly. You know, I think, I think there's a whole lot of people, including Muslims yeah. that are like, I want none of that violent stuff. Right. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, uh, having a place where they come into the conversation, I think is really important. And I think, I think it's really important for the Muslim community to actually stand up and say, we have, we have an extremist problem. We have uh, a violence problem. And we as a community need to address it. I think one of the biggest cop-outs for me um, is that when uh, someone like, you know, um, a terrorist attack is, is done in the name of Allah, uh, is done based on uh, a, a verse in the Quran, whether it's misinterpreted by that Muslim or not, um, it, it's, it's frustrating when the Islamic community doesn't actually uh, fight against it as much as I think they should. Because the only really people who can eradicate violence in the Islamic world is the Muslims. They need to, they need to, I think they need to, you know, I think there needs to be a real reality check and say, look, we are, we agree. We have a real problem with extremism. We have a real problem with, with terrorism. 
um, you know, and, and, and the, you know, the reality is a lot of Muslims do suffer from, you know, there's, I mean, Sunnis and Shias, uh, the Shia Muslims and the Sunni Muslims fight amongst each other. But, but to say that, um, that there isn't an Islamic problem with violence would, I would say is, is not very accurate to what we see in the world. I mean, look at, you know, Iran is an Islamic nation and they're bent on destroying the nation of Israel. And they, uh, they desire to have nuclear capabilities and they're threatening the nation of Israel and America um, all the time. And that's an Islamic nation run by Islamic law. So, so it's like, yes, are all Muslims bad? No, but do I see problems in Islamic system when I look at nations like Iran, when I look at uh, the Taliban, when I look at, um, you know, the, the, the creation of, of ISIS and uh, Hezbollah and, you know, um, Al Qaeda and, you know, that you, I mean, you can list them um, and it's a problem in Africa. It's a problem in Egypt. It's, you know, it's a problem in Iran. It's a problem in, in all over in, in Syria. So I guess for me, you know, look, uh, I would love for the Muslim community who are not necessarily, you know, who are living in America, like let's say Muslims living in America who have a normal American life, like they should be actually saying, yeah, I, I see the problem too. And well, let's yeah. work together to, 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 to coexist. And I think the problem is two parties need to coexist for coexistence to take place. If it's only one saying, hey, let's coexist. And the other one's like, well, Yes, but no. Um, I think that's. I think, I think that's actually why I think the Abraham Accords were yeah come about was because I think there was enough Muslims who who looked at what ISIS did yeah or what or even what Iran is doing yeah. in its proxies around the region and going yeah. that that's not what we want yeah right I mean, yeah and, and I think as a result like they're going well let's choose a different path right and yeah. and you know I think the the choice in the in the Middle East as a whole, mm. is really the the it, like Islamism, which is kind of that violent Islamic framework, yeah, and and pluralism, mm. and that's the, like you know, and there are people making choices. I'm going to go pluralism, which is like yeah. Abraham Accord countries, yeah. and then there are, there are countries and you know transnational groups going no, like we're going to mm. we're going to force Islam upon this region. Yeah, and, you know, and I think that's the the real challenges for. Again, it's one of those places where I think Christians need to, you know, cheer on, you know, more of the Abraham Accord type framework. Mm -hmm. Cheer on Christians getting yeah. involved in in that work as well, and just being, you know, again like agents of peace and reconciliation that we're called to do. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and 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 that is that is the challenge that's before us. You know, and. You know, obviously, again, you know, uh, spending so I, it's I think the advantage that I have, um, I've spent a lot of time with Muslims and I think Muslims don't realize that they must just think, oh, well, he's a he's a, a white male Christian who works in Hollywood. So he's got no understanding of my belief. I, I mean, I was you know, when I was growing up, uh, I would go to my my neighbor's house every Ramadan and we would celebrate and, you know, Aid and all these celebrations. I know them well. I know the customs. I know the cultures. I, I've, like I said, I've read the Quran um, and, and, I'm, and I love having discussions with Muslims. You know, I love to say, hey, let's, let's, let's talk this out. Um, you know, and I just think, you know, it really just comes. It's an interesting thing, you know, Luke, like here's an example, right? If a Muslim will come to me and say, I don't believe Jesus is God. Um, he's he was a prophet but he's not god right, right, right. and that that's his belief um and that's you know what his quran teaches him and i obviously strongly disagree with that but i allow him to have that opinion but however if i was to say well i you know i i don't think muhammad was a prophet i don't believe he was a prophet from god um that same comment that i would make would not be met by the same uh, respect mm. as i respect a muslim to say i don't believe jesus is god and i think that's where it becomes really interesting and difficult and you know I've received so much hate. Um, and, I, and this is a thing that's kind of really been kind of interesting from my perspective as a Christian who has 3 million followers on social media. When I start supporting Israel, the, the Muslim Arab world turns on me very quickly and says, and you know, I've never received more hate, more death threats um, for supporting a nation. So, so it's a really tough one because you know, I get to see a lot um, and, you know, to answer Miriam's question, no, I mean, I will never treat anyone differently, whatever you believe. But 
um, you know, from my own personal experience, it's uh, Islam has has not necessarily been the most uh, peaceful and tolerant um, for me to the nation of Israel and to to, to Christianity. So I want to we, we need to close this out, but let me yeah. just I want I'd love to ask like so what's the you know how should people people are just now I mean, they hear us for the first time talking yeah. about these issues yeah. How do, you, how do you suggest that they move forward? What's the course of action that they would take to know more, but also like embody uh, this kind of vision, I think, of pluralism and kind of, you know, hope for the region and, and peace and, you know, mm. people understanding uh, that it's wrong to hate Jews and stuff like that? Yeah. Well, you know, like, I mean, look, the, the, the greatest thing that happened to me was... Um, spending more time with Jewish people, you know, just as I've spent a lot of time with Muslim people to hear their heart, to, to hear their, you know, their perception, to understand where they're actually at with their own faith. Um, for me, spending time with Jewish people, which is extremely difficult to do, you know, it's not just like you can walk into a synagogue and go, hey guys, <laughs> I'm a Christian, let's all hang out because I want to get to know you. But, you know, if that's not a possibility, you know, I think trying to to get the Jewish perspective of how things are happening. And I'm not saying it's necessarily the only perspective you should gain, but to see how the Jewish people are framing what's happening in Israel and how they're presenting it. So you can find your balance in the middle, um, you know, because I think the, the ultimate problem is, is this. Uh, the world is based on not necessarily what's true anymore because of social media, but what's said the most and who's got the loudest voice. Right. And when we understand that the identity of people who are Jewish, it's probably at, at best 20 million people around the world. So yeah. you've got, tw you got 20 million people who believe strongly that they're not apartheid, that they're not trying to steal someone's land, that they're not oppressing, that they just want a right to live in the land that God promised them. And they believe that they've earned that right and that they have uh, an, a, just as much um, right to be there as the um, Arab population. And then you've got an, an Arab Islamic world, which makes up about 1.9 billion people. 1.9 billion people. Even if we were kind and said, let's say, you know, only 20% really invested in this Israeli, you know, um, Palestinian conflict, the Jewish people's voice is always going to be overshadowed by the majority of the Islamic Arab world. That's right. just facts. Right. So I think it's really important for Christians to, one, read their Bible, understand what God's doing, because patterns are important, and we need to understand patterns because it will help us see a clearer future. And two, really start trying to invest your time and energy into breaking down everything that surrounds this conflict. You know, one of the most interesting things for me is there was a massacre in Hebron in uh, 1929. Mm -hmm. um, Jews were murdered in, in Hebron. Um, and it was, it, was, it was a horrific event. It was an attack from the Arab population in Hebron to try and kill all the Jews in Hebron. But it was in 1929. Israel did not become a nation until 1948 when they um, gained their independence at the end of the British mandate. Right. But in 1929, there was already plans to try and remove Jewish people. It tells us there was a presence of Jewish people already in the land. It tells you there was already conflicts between the Jews and the Arabs into, into just even just trying to coexist. And, it's, and it also tells us that the story goes way back further than just yeah. 1948, 1967, which was the Six Day War, you know, the Gaza War. And, and we have to kind of really start tracking back and seeing how we got here. The right. problem is that takes time and that's just going to take our energy. But it's just like the Bible. If I try and do one run through the Gospels and I think I'm going to understand and know everything, I'm going to be sorely mistaken and I'm going to be led down a path that is not the way of, of the narrow road that Christ presents us. It's a daily reading. So I think just like that, we have to be diligent in our understanding of this conflict and really give ourselves our time and energy to, to really seeing what's going on. Why? The most important thing. So we're on the right side of history. So we're on the right side of what God is actually doing, not what the world is trying to think uh, or to make us convince us as what's going on. Right. Because, you know, as I was once told by uh, Pastor Randall Smith, if you read the news, if you pay attention to what the world's telling you, you're going to end up on the wrong side of God. And that's right. dangerous. Right, right. 100%. Well, thank you, Nathaniel. Really appreciate your time. Uh, 
we 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 just you know it was it was great to have yeah. this conversation with you i'm sorry i didn't uh, get to answer too many more questions <laughs> i know i know it will we still we keep it an hour so i want to yeah. make sure we we're, we honor that um yeah. yeah but you know it was uh it's been great having you um and i appreciate your insight i appreciate your commitment as a christian to standing in solidarity with with uh, the jewish people in the state yeah. of israel i think that like you said is is super key yeah. um, and we really encourage people to join the fields of action league as a as a means by which they can get called on to physically show up as as friends yeah uh, in 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 you know because that's what friends do friends show up when your friends hurting right yeah and i, I think I'll, I'll i'll just finish with this luke you know um we have such a great opportunity as christians today yeah. um we have an opportunity that um you know that that we, we, we probably have had in previous generations uh, over the last 2,000 years to stand with the Jewish people and the nation of Israel in an effort to show them a love that they don't expect. One of the most beautiful things I've ever seen, um, which was beautiful and sad at the same time, is when I stood for Israel and I, I copped a huge backlash from the Arab Islamic world and, and people who were sort of very pro-Palestinian. When I finally got to Israel, I have never ever in my life been stopped and thanked more by any other group the amount of jewish israeli people that stopped me in the street from old rabbis to young teenagers just to say thank you for for believing in us and for supporting us and what was beautiful is they had to stop me what was sad is that they were so, that they were shocked that yeah. someone who is a yeah. christian who has no stake in this land in their yeah. eyes would stand with them despite the persecution, despite the hate. We as Christians have a huge opportunity 100%. to love these people and show them the love that we were shown by their Messiah, Jesus. So that's the opportunity that's hand. Thank you. That's a, that's a great final word. I'll, leave, I'll, I'll, I'll end with that. So yeah. Thank you so much, Nathaniel. Really appreciate your time. Uh, yeah. Uh, you're, you're, you're really, uh, as some people in the questions said, you're like, you're an inspiration. So uh, thank you so much. Appreciate awesome. it. Very good. Lovely to chat with you, Luke. Likewise. Thanks, man. Take it easy. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Have a good night.